But I can tell you that scholars aren't motivated by the love of knowledge alone. There's nothing like a large hunk of cash to focus the mind. By the early 800s, the ruling elite of the Islamic Empire were pouring money into a truly ambitious project, which was global in scale and which was to have a profound impact on science. It was to scour the libraries of the world for scientific and philosophical manuscripts in any language. Greek, Syriac, Persian and Sanskrit. Bring them to the empire and translate them into Arabic. This became known as the translation movement. scholars put into finding ancient texts was astonishing. And one key reason for this is that bringing a book to the caliph, which you could add to his library, could be extremely lucrative. The story goes that the caliph al Ma'mun was, was so obsessed that he would send his messengers out of Baghdad far and wide to distant lands just to get hold of books that he didn't possess for the translation movement. And anyone who brought him back a book that he didn't have he'd repay him its weight in gold. To give some sense of the extent of this activity, sort of between 750 and 950, um, somebody called Anadim, who wrote a list of sort of the intelligentsia of the Abbasid era, lists 70 translators. So it was quite a large cohort of people involved in translation, and obviously he only named the well-known they could get up to 500 gold dinars a month, which is probably around $24,000, which is a huge sum of money for what they were doing. It was a very, very prestigious, well-paid, well-patronized activity. But the Islamic Empire's obsession to uncover the knowledge of the ancients went beyond practical matters like medicine. Many, like the Caliph al Ma'mun, believed that the people of antiquity possessed dark, even magical powers. And what's more, new evidence is coming to light to show just how hard Islamic scientists worked to rediscover them. <laughs> to find out about that story, I have to visit the harsh burnt yellow of the Sahara Desert in Egypt. There I am to meet an academic who wants to show me how the translation movement took the Arabs to Egypt on a quest to break a code, which they thought hid the secret of the dark art of alchemy. This is Saqqara, a necropolis or graveyard of the ancient pharaohs. Over a 10-acre site, it's a collection of burial chambers and step pyramids that were built in the third millennium before Christ. These are said to be among the oldest stone buildings in the world. Mind the step here. Archaeologist Dr. Okasha Aldali is my guide. He was about to reveal the most astonishing story of my journey so far. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Like most people, I believed that Egyptian hieroglyphs had remained completely undeciphered until the 19th century. Then came the chance discovery of the famous Rosetta Stone. This stone had the same inscription written in both hieroglyphs and Greek. It provided the crucial clues which British and French scholars used to decipher the writings of ancient Egypt. That's the usual story one hears. But Dr. Aldali has made a discovery that dramatically alters it. He has recently unearthed a number of rare works by the Islamic scholar Ibn Wahshiya. What he did was figure out a correspondence between hieroglyphs like these and letters in the Arabic alphabet. If you look here, for example, at Ibn Wahshiya's manuscript, you see he's giving us the Egyptian hieroglyphic 
signs oh, yes, that have Arabic phonetic value. Underneath. Yes, and they have the phonetic value in Arabic underneath. So look very carefully at this one. He says seen underneath that seat. Yes. Now look at this seat here. That is yes. S. That seat in Egyptian hieroglyphic is used for the sign S, seen, which okay. is what you see here, seen. That is the name of the god Osiris. Osiris. Oh, with an S. That's a C. Yeah. This is the letter H. This one here. This is the Ha. The water wave. The water, right. Is the letter N, or Noon in Arabic. T. And the letter F. These are all letters. These are all letters. But, then he realized but how did he decipher the hieroglyphs? The one good thing about the early Arab scholars was their ability to link ancient Egyptian language, we call hieroglyphic, to link it with their own contemporary Coptic. They realized that Coptic is nothing but the later stage of ancient Egyptian language. And they realized this because the translation movement had literally placed hundreds of Coptic texts into their hands. The scholars could now see a direct link between hieroglyphs and Arabic. What fraction of these symbols would have been correctly deciphered? They got about 14 letters. They got more than half of the Egyptian hieroglyphic correctly. So that was a remarkable achievement for people in the 9th century, 10th century. Well. That's probably the biggest revelation for me so far on, on my travels, that uh, Egyptology didn't begin in the 19th century. Yet again, it seems that Islamic scholars actually cracked hieroglyphics, and they cracked it for, for strange reasons. They cracked it because they were interested in, in astrology and, and alchemy. But here is another example of this amazing translation movement. They weren't just translating Greek and, and, and Indian and Persian texts, they were translating Egyptian hieroglyphics as well. Absolutely incredible.